have the healthiest diet, you're still going to have lower NAD levels by the time you, you know, you're, you're in the latter half of your life. So that's why these supplements are thought to help because they'll boost up those older levels of NAD to where they were when you were young. Okay, so let's talk about the first uh, NAD booster, probably the most well-known. It's definitely the most well-studied of the NAD boosters and probably the most taken, used. Uh, that's NR. Which stands for nicotinamide riboside. So that's the vitamin B3 plus the sugar. Without the N part, which is a phosphate, um, we'll get to the phosphate. That's important later. It may make a difference. But NR has been taken uh, over the counter or through websites for what, since 2014, uh, either solely uh, just as a capsule or there's some companies that sell it in combination with other molecules. And because it's been pretty well studied in humans, there's been plenty of human studies, um, at least in the short term, that show uh, little to no side effects. This is a, a pretty safe molecule. That's for sure. And we, we know that if you take it uh, as a supplement, just swallow the pill, uh, either 250 milligrams per day or a gram, there's no apparent negative side effects. Uh, and in fact, you will raise NAD levels in blood tests. So it, I think this is an important distinction to make, though, like there's a difference between safe and effective, right? Just because we say something is safe doesn't mean it's going to work in it. And in fact, sometimes things that are the most safe aren't going to work at all. That's why they're so safe is they don't have any effect. Um, but we do know that NR is largely safe. You know, millions of people around the world take it. Um, NR has been well studied in animals as well. And let's start with that because we actually know more about what NR does in the bodies of animals than we do in the bodies of humans. Well, let's start with yeast. Go even further back. Okay, yeah. So that's where it was first discovered. Um, NR was a new, newly discovered molecule back in the early 2000s. It's found a little bit in, in milk and other foodstuffs. And if it was fed to yeast, they lived longer by turning on the yeast sirtuin pathway. Okay, how much longer were the yeast living? Uh, generally, yeast live about 30% longer when you give them these molecules, uh, similar to caloric restriction. And that's what this was doing, mimicking caloric restriction, because both activate the sirtuins and give increased genome stability and epigenome stability that lengthens their life. And those kinds of findings make you really interested because you're really interested in the sirtuin activation. Um, and so you've been part of a group of scientists that have been looking at this. Yeah, one of the first things that we discovered, this is now, we're talking 2002, 2003 in my lab, is that there's an NAD synthesis gene called PNC1. In our body, it's called NAMPT, and it gets activated by these mild stresses. In a yeast cell, it's low salt, it's low sugar, heat, and that turns on the synthesis of NAD, and we found that extended lifespan. And then a few years later, it was shown that you can mimic this effect with this NR. How does NR turn into NAD? So NR has to go through an intermediate molecule. Let, let's start with the mouth. You swallow your NR, it'll go into the gut. Some of it will be met metabolized by the, the gut bacteria, uh, but it will, most of it will go into the bloodstream and then flow around and then get taken up into your muscle and to your brain and other cells that uh, by transporters called ENTs. And there it's converted into NMN by what are called NRKs. And then you add the phosphate and you've got this thing, NMN. What's NMN? Nicotinamide mono nucleotide, and then the cell puts two of those together to make NAD. Before we get to that, I, I think it's worth talking about why can't we just take vitamin B3, which is a precursor to NR. And uh, you can, but it doesn't raise NAD levels anywhere near the level that NR does. Um, and NR doesn't seem to be as effective as NMN. So the closer you get to NAD with your molecule, the better it seems. And that's probably because you need to bring in other components. So if you just take vitamin B3, you need a sugar and the phosphate. If you just take NR, you need the phosphate. And phosphate is pretty rare in the body. You, it's in your bones, it's in your DNA. And maybe when you take NR, one of the issues is that you need to find the phosphate to add on there before it becomes active. For instance, all the research with NAD and then moving backwards to NMN and then moving backwards to NR. Yeah, well, it all started in yeast when I was at Harvard in the early uh, 2000s. Even in yeast, if you give them NAD, it doesn't work because it's too big. It doesn't get taken up into the cells. So what we want to do is back off in size. So the next smaller molecule behind NAD is NMN. And there, there we know there's a transporter protein that sucks it into cells. And NR is even smaller and it gets taken up even better into cells. And so that's the reason why it may be that NMN is at the sweet spot of the right size, but also has the right components to make just the right amount of NAD.